Okay, everybody, glad y'all here tonight, and we'll, uh, I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 7 tonight. I just feel like I covered that as well as I wanted it to cover, because it's a very important chapter for the New Testament Christian. So I just wanted to go back over uh, some things that uh, I made a few notes on. So that's what we'll do tonight, and uh, then we'll uh, pray, and then we're going to eat some blueberry. What did you make? Blueberry coffee. Coffee. If you like that. Thank you, Brother Ronnie. Oh, that. Uh, if you don't, just get on wine. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we'll pray. Got a couple of things we need to pray about, so mm -hmm. we'll pray at the end. So anyway, I want to go back over... And, you know, the thing, you know, I, I hit some things last week that I won't go over again this week. Uh, but I want to I want to look at some verses here. I want to go to verse 4. It says, Likewise, my brothers, this is Romans chapter 7. Likewise, my brothers, you have also died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now, so what he said here is you died to the law. In other words, the first covenant you had. Remember last week we talked about like a marriage covenant. First covenant, so your first husband died because we're the bride of Christ. So now you are married to Christ, which, in, which is a new covenant. So you died to one and you live in the other one. So you died to the law, now you live in the spirit. And uh, it's important for, for if we get this in our minds when we're struggling with sin. When we get this, it will help us in our struggle. He said, in order that you might bear fruit for God. The, the fruit that he's talking about here is, is different from like the fruit of the Spirit, which we find in Galatians 5. The fruit that he is talking about here is the fruit that God gave us. The fruit that, that he's talking about for God is would be the same that a married couple would, would bear fruit. He said, he told Adam and Eve, he said, go be fruitful and multiply, bear fruit. In other words, to procreate. So then when he's talking about, so you, you died to one, now you live in the spirit that you might bear fruit for God, that would be fruit after its own kind. In other words, that you, you bear fruit in seeing new souls come into the same knowledge and faith that you have. In other words, new souls, new believers, people who who were once enslaved and in bondage and bound to bear fruit would be to see those same people just like you were to be set free. Free from sin and death and living as we are as believers in Christ in spirit and in life. So then... He says, for while we were living in the flesh, verse 5, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So in, under the old covenant, under the law, remember, we'll say it one more time, the law does not cure sin. The law makes no way for, to alleviate sin. Uh, ultimately you will die okay the spirit brings life so the, the only fruit that you would have bore under the law is to bear the fruit of death because the law shows us identifies our sinful passions and we lean into our sinful passions and when we do <clears throat> the fruit there is death now, he says in verse 6, But now we are released from the law. Aren't you glad? Amen. Having died to that which held us captive. 
and what held us captive? Sin. The law didn't hold you captive. Remember, the law is holy and it's good. That's what he says it right here in chapter 7. He said it's holy, it's good, and it's righteous. So the law didn't hold you captive, but it, but it was your sin that held you captive, and the law was unable to break that, that sin. So a lot of people get confused on that. That's what he keeps trying to say. The law in itself is not bad. Okay? But because that's all you had, you were never going to get free from it. You had no remedy for sin. You had no recourse for sin. All you had was the judgment of sin. That's what the law brought. So you were held captive so that we serve, look at this, in the new way. I like, uh, when I went back and just looking, I, was like, I, I liked how this was phrased, in the new way, and I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, of the spirit and not in the old way <coughs> of a different code. In other words, when we were under now listen, when we're talking about the law here, obviously we're talking about the Mosaic law. But it's been my experience that there are more laws out there than that. And, and they're religious laws. And, and we, you know, we are, we're, guilty. we're guilty of adding laws, you know. Yeah. Well, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do this. If we're not careful, human beings will add, they will add weights to you. Okay, so but he said now, so you were under this burden of doing things that would never work for you. That was the way that you lived. In other words, what does a way mean? Way means a path. It means, so now we had an old path, an old way to walk. Now we have a new path, a new way to walk. Now we have a new economy. Okay, economy is, is just... Some, you know, we, we, we think about money and, and giving and taking money, but economy basically means how you how you do something, how you barter, how you trade, how you how you do anything. So we're we're out of an old economy into a new economy. It's a new way. It's a new way to do it. A new wall. A new covenant. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter fourteen. Verse number six, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So this old way, we're free from it. And we walk in the new way, which is Christ Jesus, because he is the way. Remember, he said in verse one, he said, he said, I'm going, and where I go, you'll follow me, because you know the way. In other words, you know me. I am the way. So, again, why? Uh, here's the question then. Why, why do we, as believers, why do we do that? Why do we add to the perfect work of Christ? Why do we do that? Why? Let's look at what Paul told the Corinthian church. I, I want to see what he says here. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, he said, Paul said this. He said, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, Paul was saying to the church in Corinth, he said, when I come to you, I ain't coming to you with no baggage. I ain't adding anything to it. All I'm going to give you is Jesus Christ. Why don't we do that? Why do, why do we have to add different things to it? Why do we have to do different things? And in, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, he said this. Well, in verse 10, According to the grace of God, given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how he builds 
upon it. Look at what he says in verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So when we walk in the new way, Jesus is a way, any time we add something back to it, we're laying something on the foundation that shouldn't be there. I wish the church of Jesus Christ would just get back to that. I, I wish we'd done it 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, 100 years ago. I wish we'd just got get back to Jesus and Him alone. But no, we got to come in with all these different programs. Ain't nothing wrong with programs. But if they take away, if they add to, right? One of the things that we run into, uh, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, talking about it tonight, because you're all believers and grounded in the Word of God, but one of the things we run into in the, in the 19th and the 20th and now the 21st century is we try to add so much psychology to our faith when it simply should be faith in Christ alone. There's nothing wrong with counseling. There's, I've said that before. There's nothing wrong with, you know, talking to somebody, you know, and that kind of thing. But anything, any type of counseling should be simply the Word of God. Any type of talking should be the Word of God. If I'm going to, if I'm going to counsel you, if I'm going to try to give you wisdom, I'm going to try to help you, I should point you to the Word of God. Yeah. You know, I was preaching on that the other Sunday, and I was like, the Word of God gives you the answer for everything that you need. You want to know how to raise your kid? Go to the Word of God. You want to know how to handle your finances? Go to the Word of God. You want to know what to do when your body's sick? Go to the Word of God. You want to know what to do when somebody does you wrong? Go to the Word of God. You want to know what to do when you've done somebody wrong? Go to the Word of God. So he'll handle all your... The Word of God handles it. So we need to get back and listen, if you got off somewhere, get back there. Just get back to the Word of God. Don't lay any foundation on anything. Don't put nothing on it. That's, what, that's why Paul was making it clear to the church in Corinth. He said, now when I come to you, I came to you with nothing save Jesus Christ. That's all I'm going to talk to you about. That's all I'm going to point to. That's all I'm going to point you to. Everything that I'm going to point you to Jesus because what greater foundation? Because he's the way. Amen? Amen. Now, let's look. Remember, I'm just going to hit some things that I, I, I didn't feel like we was. I hit them well enough last week. So in verse 10 of chapter Romans chapter 7, he said, The very commandment that promised life, look at this. The very commandment now he's talking about the law, all of it. That promised life proved to be death to me. See, it, it, it's a false hope. The commandment that promised life <coughs> proved to be death to me. It's a, it's a false hope. It's an empty promise. And it results in the frustration of sin and death. Because the law... In other words, I'd say it like this. The law is not to cure. The law just identifies. Yeah. And so you get frustrated. Now, when we, when we lay stuff on people, when we lay stuff on people, you ought to do this, and you ought to do that, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, all we're doing is causing those people to get frustrated. Right? You know, I've said it often before. When I got saved, which is 45 years ago, 46, coming up on 46, I think. You know, when I joined the church, I had to sign a little card that said I wouldn't drink, I wouldn't smoke, wouldn't, wouldn't use tobacco of no kind, wouldn't go to any kind of work, I wouldn't go to the movies. I mean, I'm serious. So what, what they were doing, they were adding stuff to me. So what that what what that I've seen this happen. What it caused with a lot of people, instead of getting set free, it took them deeper into bondage. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get rid of their. They was addicted 
like the tobacco or whatever, and they couldn't get set free from it because that kept them in bondage. And we did that. Christians did that. We added stuff to it. And so then we, done, we did what Paul said. The thing that's supposed to give you life frustrated you. It flipped on you. It's like I was preaching the other week that you're leaning on a, on a, on a reed that's broken. And you're going to fall. And, you, and sometimes you won't get back up. I've seen it so many times, folks. People just get frustrated with and they leave. And they said, that's it. I can't do this stuff. I can't handle all this church stuff. Puts too much on them. Verse 11 says, Eleven and one one ain't I gotta find it in a minute. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and though and through it killed me. Now, again, go on to the so sin not the law. Sin not the law. Not the law. Sin not the law deceived me and killed me. It was still my choice. Because it goes on to say. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. See what the... So I'm not, I'm not saying the law... He's not saying the law is bad. It's holy. But it's sin that deceives you. Okay? But anywhere there is no law, there is no sin. Right? I mean, if there's, we're not under the law, that's why we... Well, all oh no, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, if there's not, that's what he was saying. So the law's still there, but we're not to be judged by the law. That's why the sin, you know, there's no sin because we, if, if there's no law, it says, you know, then you can't sin. Right. I think I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know if I can place it like I went to or not. Well, I understand what you're saying because. The law brings death. Grace brings life. Spirit brings life. So even there is sin. Yeah. There is sin. And that's the Holy Spirit convinces that it's sin. Yes. Right. There, right. So right. there is sin. But the grace to forgive the sin cleanses you. But that, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Okay. The Holy. <laughs> So the law is holy. Yeah, I already said that. Verse 15 says, For I do not understand my own actions. And I've talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to hit you. This one was very really important. For I do not do what I want, but the, but I do the thing, the very thing I hate. So how many can say amen to that? Things I don't want to do, you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to lose my temper. Mm -hmm. I wind up losing my temper. Right. I don't want to get anxious. I don't want to get scared. I don't want to get fearful. I don't want to. I don't want to walk in 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 unbelief. But I do. How many knows that? Yes. You know, you the phone ring. You get a bad. You get a call, and first thing you know, you go. Your mind goes to the worst yes. of the worst. I don't want to do that. I'd rather say, oh, God's got this. Praise the Lord. I trust the Lord. But I, I, I do that. I, 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 so verse 16 said, now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. So now there's no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells within me. It's still a sin problem. Sin that dwells in my flesh. And when I want to do right, verse 21, evil, how I many knows it's true? When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Now, this is why I believe this chapter is so important to New Testament believers. When we understand that it's not all about the do's and the don'ts and the wills and the wants and the can's and the can'ts and don't do this and don't do that. Don't eat this and 
and make sure you don't say this, make sure you don't that. When you try to do that, sin is going to lie close at hand. But when you walk in the Spirit, which we're going to talk about uh, in chapter 8, when you walk in the Spirit of life, I don't have to so much focus on, okay, well, hold on a minute, uh, let's see now, before I, before I go over here to, to this place of business, let me see if it's okay. Now, is it Monday? Can I go on a Monday too? You understand what I'm saying? And, and um, Well, I can't go because it's Wednesday and I can't go on a Wednesday, right? Well, I gotta look at that. No, what Ronnie said, the Spirit of God will lead me. Now, how many how many know what I'm talking about? How many knows that there's things that you can you can do that there is no conviction that you whatsoever you could do? There are things that I could do 15 years ago that I can't do now. I can't do those things now. But it wasn't a written commandment. It was the Spirit of God writing it in my heart telling me, no, you don't need to do that. And I knew it was good. Now, once he told me not to, Ronnie, by the Spirit, if I do it, then that becomes sin. To me. I, I become disobedient to what the Spirit of God said. But you, uh, on the other hand, could do it all day long, and it's still okay. It, it depends on where I am in my walk with the Lord. Now, there are certain things that are black and white seeing everybody. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't steal. You don't run around. You don't covet. You don't gossip. You know, you don't, you don't lose your anger, you, you know, and, and, and get furious with somebody. You don't do those things. Everybody knows that. But then there are other things that, as you grow in the Lord, he might say, you know what, give me you. You probably need to leave that one. You do. That is the freedom of the Spirit. You are no longer then walking such a tightrope that you're scared you're going to fall off every time. And you're not on, and here's the thing. You stop trying to do it in your own power. That's what I want you to get tonight. Stop trying to do it in your own strength. You do it by the grace and power of God then. And by the Spirit. Because it brings life, not death. Amen? Verse 23 says, But I see in my members another law. So there's more than one law. There's Moses' law. There's laws that we add. There's laws that... The Baptist church adds, Pentecostal church adds, and the Catholic church adds. There's just all kind of laws. So when he says there's another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? <coughs> In other words, there's a fight going on. But thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what he said in verse 25. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. This will help you, okay? With my mind. In other words, my mind is safe. But my flesh ain't quite made it yet. Come on, somebody. That's, that's, the, that's the fight. One day, praise God, we'll have a new body. One day we'll be free from this sinful flesh. Remember, we talked about that. We still walk around with that DNA of Adam in it, but our spirit, we got the DNA of Christ in us, and we're walking free. So, when we understand that, when we understand that, we can do this. I hope I'm making sense tonight. We can 
we can let the spirit dominate what we do rather than the flesh. If the flesh dominates, we will sin. Well, isn't it kind of like what you're talking about? When he's talking about the flesh, he's basically talking about our sin nature, our old flesh man, fleshly man, and the wars between the new new us, the new spirit real man, and the old flesh man that don't want to stay dead, he wants to rise up. He wants to rise up. Because I'm breathing. Yeah. I'm living. This thing hadn't been changed yet. Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, fully man, fully God, when he came up out of that tomb, his flesh was completely changed. Right? We got witnesses that. He walked through a wall and all this kind of stuff. He walked around with holes in his hand, not bleed. Right? Mine ain't there yet. And yours is not either. One day it will be. So we war, we, we fight. This is a constant fight. Now as you mature in Christ, and as you grow in the Lord, and as you, you know, the Word of God, again, the Word of God is truth and it's life. And it will help you. The Spirit of God, will, when you pray in the Spirit, when you pray full of the Spirit of God, He builds, your, he builds you up. So that your spirit becomes strong, stronger than your flesh. And if, if we will just trust in God, our spirit will win out. But in them moments, when the flesh rises up and gets a little bit stronger, we might have lost the fight, Ronnie. But we hadn't lost the war. We might lose a battle every now and then. But the victory has been won through Christ Jesus. And as long as we remember that, we won't fall on our face and say, oh me, and we won't quit. And we won't give up. And we won't give in. And we won't give out. We'll walk in victory. Because who the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen? Yeah. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Probably hit that chapter about five, six months. Kenya, there's a very important chapter for all believers.